Hello, everyone, and welcome to Running Interactive Meetings and Workshops. I'm Lindsay. I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Miro, and I'm also joined by my colleague, Matt. And Matt here from the Customer Education Team. And we're excited today to take you through a training on how to run interactive meetings and workshops in Miro. This will be a live demo in the product, really tactical and hands-on, so you get some experience on how to use Miro in your meetings. All right. Are we going to wait for a couple of minutes for people to join, or should we get started? Hope everyone's enjoying all this, all the sessions today. Yes, it's been an awesome kickoff to Distributed. Um, really enjoyed the sessions yesterday. And actually, one of my highlights from yesterday was the boarding passes. Matt, did you get a chance to check those out? I saw them. Yeah, they look really fun. I love, mm -hmm, I love seeing everyone's uh, boarding passes shared on social. Yeah, it's cool. Fun idea. All right, I think we're just waiting for the screen share. OK, just let me know when it's live, because I can't see it just on my one monitor. There it is. OK, it's live. All right. All right, awesome. So let's move Shall we off. begin then? We OK. Can... Yep. All right, so we already did intros, but once again, I'm Lindsay, um, product marketing here at Miro. And my name is Matt. I'm from the customer education team at Miro. So today, our agenda, we're going to walk through an overview of how to run interactive meetings and workshops in Miro. We'll cover designing an awesome board, onboarding new Miro users, the facilitation tools that Miro has, and a section we call the aftermath. What do you do with your Miro boards after you leave the session? Finally, we'll cover plans and sharing. And at the end, we'll have time for question and answer. And you'll use the same Slido link that uh, you've been using previously. And we'll be monitoring that to um, answer the most upvoted questions. So definitely put your questions in Slido for us to respond at the end. So what is Miro? If this is your first look at Miro, it is an online collaborative whiteboarding platform. So we're a cloud-based whiteboard that remote and distributed teams use to collaborate in real time. It's available in the browser, in desktop apps, in mobile apps. So you can take the whiteboard with you wherever you go. Some of the key concepts about Miro. Well, first is that Matt is actually on a Miro board right now. He's presenting from our presentation mode on a Miro board. And as you can see, it is an infinite canvas uh, and it's free form. So you can really design your boards however best meet your needs. Right now we've designed ours in more of a presentation style, but you can design it like a workshop, like a brainstorm, as a team or a knowledge hub uh, for workflows, whatever you really need to use it as. It is a live collaboration tool. So if you've been on some of our distributed boards, you've probably seen this, which is many cursors moving around a board at the same time. In this video, it's actually from an internal Miro meeting. We have about 95 Miro Nears on a board together for a live brainstorm. So it really helps to replicate that in-person experience of collaborating together side by side. Cool. And in this session, we're not going to be covering very much about the basics of Miro and how to create you know, the, the core concepts. We're going to be focusing on specifically interactive meetings and workshops and what you need to be successful running those. But for those of you who are joining and you just need a quick refresher, there are a couple of core elements that we're going to be combining in order to create good experiences for our workshop participants. The first is the use of what's called a frame. And if you look, um, there's a, kind of a border that's surrounding some objects here. And if I move that border by clicking on the title, 
of it, which is the title of the frame, you can see that all the content moves with it. Frames are super, super important to making sure that you keep your boards organized Arc. and digestible by other people who join your boards. Um, and within those, you can do lots of different activities. And of course, in Miro, you can have things like sticky notes, which is over here on the left-hand toolbar. Whenever you create something or add it to Miro, you're going to be looking to the left-hand toolbar. You can connect objects with lines. You can draw various types of shapes. And you can even draw with our pen tool, which is a really cool experience if you have a touch screen or something like that. And for those of you who would like to get even more introduction into our tool, we have a weekly session, Getting Started with Miro. Start, it, it'll resume next week. It's on Thursdays. And whenever you want to view, visit one of those sessions, you can click on the question mark at the top right of your board. You can see mine has a badge there. And you can scroll. You can visit our online academy, which is right here. Or you can visit our webinars page to view more of our ongoing live sessions, even after distributed. Things like the Getting Started with Miro uh, webinar. So today we're covering how to use Miro for meetings and workshops. And meetings and workshops is a really broad category. We see teams using Miro for a wide variety of different meetings. Some common ones that we see are design sprints or design thinking workshops, brainstorming or ideation sessions, retrospective sprint plannings. Um, we also see Miro being used for large scale planning sessions like PI planning, OKR planning, or maybe your annual planning that's coming up here in just a couple months. So Miro can really support you in any of the interactive meetings where you typically work together around a whiteboard, where you need inputs from many different people at one time, and you find that it's a bit too limiting to achieve this in a video call alone. Cool. So, all right, enough intro. Let's get into the meat of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, the first topic is really, really important. It's about some of the best tips that we've collected from our, you know, our own experience, but also the, you know, many facilitators that we've been able to speak through who all use Miro to facilitate workshops and meetings. And how do they design their boards? The first thing we're going to cover is a general recommendation about how you can organize the different aspects of your boards and solve some or pre-solve some uh, common problems that you might encounter. You can see, of course, this is kind of a representation of what your board structure might look like. And we're going to be sending this board to you afterwards so you can take another look. But let me just walk through you walk you through it right now. You can see that we've broken up our activities with frames again. And if you want to add a frame to your mirror board, you're going to go on the left hand side and you're going to find this this tool that kind of looks like a square. And inside there, you can find some pre-built ratios or you can do your own ratio, whichever you wish. But it's really important that you organize your frames, not only by just using them, but keeping them square, kind of grouping them when they're related to the same activity and things like that. You can also see that we've kind of created groups of frames by using these shapes. So we go to the shape tool and we draw a square or yeah, just essentially a square. And we type inside the square using some bold font so that even when you're zoomed really far out, participants are going to be able to understand what you are thinking. And when you were designing the board. In the bottom left-hand corner, we've kept some um, areas for an icebreaker. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about icebreakers. But essentially, the idea is that when you're doing online workshops and you're working with participants, not only do you have to, as the facilitator, onboard them into the frameworks that you might be using or give them the context for the ideas they're trying to solve, you also might have to onboard them to Miro. And we highlight icebreakers as a really interesting and useful way to help people get on board to Miro before the workshop even begins. We've used a line here to separate two major sections of our board. And then we have the first activity um, grouped underneath a large shape again. The instructions are here so that people can always reference back to the instructions because people get lost when they're remote and they can always read the instructions. And we've used frames to give each individual or small group 
room that they can work on problems in uh, individually, essentially. And um, once they've done that, they can go ahead and start to synthesize the activity in a larger frame just below or off to the side. And we'll discuss some ideas on how you can synthesize ideas or um, converge with your ideas in just a second. So we hope that's kind of the general format that might be helpful for you. We've found it to be very successful, so it's highly recommended. Two last things to recommend. Um, one is lots of elements in your board will be non-interactive, and that's okay. So select those elements and click on the lock button to lock them down so that way your new participants who are just getting used to Miro won't move them around by accident. If you are the board owner, the board owner, which essentially means you've created the board, look for the protected lock, which means that only you will ever be able to unlock items, and check for the hide frame function, which will allow you to sequentially reveal parts of your board as you go through the workshop. Okay, so I did that a little fast. When you select an item, look for the lock button to lock things down, and then look for the hide frame button in order to sequentially release things kind of as you're going through the workshop. All right, cool. So Lindsay's gonna talk a little bit more about not just how does the board should, should it be laid out, but more ideologically, how can you structure your workshop? Absolutely. So on an infinite canvas, you can really go in any direction at any time. So how do you build your flow um, and what makes sense for your for your participants? When working with facilitators, one general rule that we've seen that works really well is to go from a divergent thinking activity to a convergent thinking activity. And this example is a great like four step workshop you could do um, that starts with First, understanding what are the needs. So let's do a di divergent exercise to generate ideas um, and to gather inputs about maybe what we should focus on. Now, following that, we can converge and make a decision on what we should focus on. After that, we can take a break and then come back from our workshop and then move into a divergent thinking exercise again to brainstorm solutions for the ideas or for the decision that we made previously and then finally selecting what we wanna do and moving forward. So Miro has a ton of different templates and activities that can help you to achieve both of these. On the left-hand side, we have our divergent thinking exercises such as brain writing, six thinking hats, um, classic just brainstorming with sticky notes, random word generator, mind maps. These are all great ways to generate a lot of ideas and a lot of inputs. And Miro really helps you to do this in an inclusive way because people can just put their ideas on the board, right? They don't need to um, take over the mic on the phone per se. Uh, they can, how we can have multiple people adding ideas at the same time. If you go into our templates library, which is on the left-hand side, you'll be able to browse through many different um, types of activities to find the one that fits um, your needs best. On the right hand side, we have our convergent activities. So after we generate ideas, we're gonna to need to make a decision and we wanna do that in an inclusive way as well. And so we have some suggestions here. One is to do a voting exercise. You can do affinity or impact mapping. Uh, we can also do clustering and categorization. So to the right here, we have an example of clustering. So with sticky notes, you have a ton of customizations. We have visual colors that we can use to visually group our sticky notes. We also have tags. So if we zoom in, we can see these tags on the board, which help us to create categories and clusters. We can manually cluster our sticky notes, literally just by grabbing them, bringing them together, making clusters. We also have and auto cluster ability. So if you highlight a group of stickies, it will grab those and make a cluster for you as well. So you don't need to manually organize those. And we have a brand new tool, which is the latest addition to our Miro platform, which is called the clusterizer. And on the right hand side here, we have a group of unclustered stickies with a bunch of tags on it. So what the clusterizer will do will allow you to highlight all of these stickies. So to find go, um, platform apps or to add new tools, you would click on the three dots and you should be able to find apps uh, like Clusterizer there. 
It's taking a second to load there. Uh oh. Looks like we need to reinstall it. <laughs> well, anyway, Maybe. let's just talk through the Brand new, just released yesterday or today, maybe? It will allow you to highlight those stickies and to make an affinity diagram based on the tags. So it will pull the tags apart and auto-generate clusters for you so that you don't need to manually cluster. So for facilitators, this can save you a ton of time having to synthesize the work of your attendees. Maybe while they're on a break, you'll get to take a break as well versus going through all the sticky notes and making manual clusters. So sorry we weren't able to show you that live, but if you go to the Mural Marketplace and install the clusterizer, you should be able to give that a try yourself. Another way that we can converge is through a voting activity. And one great way to do that is through dot voting. In our templates library, you'll find a dot voting template, which will include participant names and the set number of dots. You can customize this dot voting template to meet your needs, delete dots if there's too many votes um, so that your audience can have the right number, and then just go ahead and drag them to the area of the board that you want to vote on. Miro also has another way to vote that we'll be showing you in just a little bit uh, with our built-in voting plugin. Mira is really investing in meetings and workshops, and we have a couple of exciting upcoming integrations that we just wanted to mention. So the first is the Google Calendar extension, which enables you to turn any meeting into a Miro meeting. With the Google Calendar extension, you'll be able to attach boards, both new and existing, to any meeting that you generate from a Google Calendar invite. And it will automatically provision that board with the right access rights so that everyone that you invite to the meeting can easily click on that link, join you on the board, uh, and start collaborating. And the second exciting integration that we're actually announcing today that's upcoming is the Miro Zoom app. With the launch of Zoom Zaps, Miro is an early access launch partner. So we're excited to work on this integration and bring you a Miro Zoom app soon so that you can turn any video call into an interactive session and attach Miro boards easily to your Zoom calls as well. That's going to be so cool. Being able to have Miro right inside Zoom. I'm super excited for that. Awesome. So that is all about board design. So we covered kind of the layout more um, ideologically, like how can you structure your board or structure your workshop? What are some example activities you can do to produce good results? Now we want to dial in on that specific thing that I mentioned a little while ago, which is onboarding users to Miro, which is when we're doing these remote workshops, it's an added layer to um, to address. And we have a few examples on uh, suggestions on how you can do that. And it's really important that we take this intentionally. The first is using a how to Miro frame. I have an example here that you can emulate on your own. The key here is to really only highlight elements that are relevant for the workshop. So if you're going to be using images or pulling in files from around the web to get it like a mood board or something like that, show them how to use uh, the Google image search. If you're going to navigate around the board, which is everyone find our nav uh, how to navigate Miro video on YouTube and put it into the board, um, things like that, show them the, the features of Miro that they need to know. Of course, they don't need to know everything if they're just a participant. So focus in on only what's necessary. If you go to our community right now, there's actually a competition in our community to build the best how to Miro board. And those boards will be added to our Miroverse, which brings me to the second way that you can be super intentional about onboarding your participants to Miro. And when you receive this board link, you can find the link to the specific Miroverse section. Miroverse is our collection of community-made templates, right? We have our template library, which is available here on the left-hand side. But Miroverse allows you to add boards. I'm going to go to it now. Allows you to add boards made by our community. And it is so cool. 
And if you go there now, you will find that there is an icebreaker section. And there are so many. Um, there's like over a dozen here. Really, really cool. Made by our community members, all with different uh, ways, like drawing characters and all the different ways to get people to kind of get them navigating around the board, get them to um, loosen up and to do, you know, just really prep them for a good, uh, a good workshop experience. Okay, so we have the how to Miro frame, we have icebreakers in Miro. And now the last thing that I want to point out is a, a feature called visual notes. And if you look in the top right of your board, can you see that in the screen share, Lindsay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So if you look at the top right of your board, you will find that there is a kind of document looking icon. And in there, we can have uh, high level notes about our workshop or about the board. And you can see that we've used it to outline some sort of purpose to our board. We've um, written what the schedule is going to be. And we've even, if you go down to the bottom here, you can see that it says pre-work, where we've list linked to some useful assets, such as the Getting Started with Miro Academy course, where you would click on that and users could go and take that online course. Um, you can also see that we've linked to parts of the board itself. So if I click on this that says Matt colon icebreaker activity, I can click on that and I've used the object link to create a link to the board content. So it might have been hard to see just now, but by clicking on the link, it actually took me to that area of the board. So I'll click on it now again. You can see it took me to that how to Miro frame. Really, really neat. The key thing to remember when you're using visual notes as a part of your onboarding toolkit is to pin the notes open. So if you see, here's my, here's my notes panel. Um, up at the top left of my notes panel, there's this little pin icon. If I pin that open, anyone who opens this board, the visual notes will be open for them as well. So it kind of, um, kind of puts it in their face, so to speak, uh, so that they have to read it and they can see what kind of information you thought was most relevant for them to get started. Visual notes are a really, really, really cool feature. Lots of use cases for that. Yeah, I think it's especially great for people who may not be as familiar with a whiteboard because it gives them a doc, right? Something linear, something text-based that they're familiar with that they can then use to navigate around the board. All That's right, true. let's talk about facilitation and some capabilities we have to help you manage a great session while you're in your Miro board. So the first one is one of our most popular, it's attention management. And what it allows you to do as a facilitator is to bring everyone to you on the board so you can focus their attention and direct them to the right area of the board where they may be, um, you know, off on some different area. Maybe you have them in breakout rooms. It's time to come back for the main discussion. You can call them in. So Matt's hovering over that right now. So to access this, you go to the top right-hand corner, you click on your avatar, and then you click bring everyone to me. And let me go to a different area of the board so you can see when Matt clicks that, that it will zoom me over to where he is. So Lindsay's way there over I there, am. you can see. Right, so I'm gonna zoom back in and I'll click bring everyone to me. And there is my cursor. I've zoomed over. And now if we bring our video back up, I'll show you no hands. I'm actually following around uh, Matt on the board. So um, this really allows him to present and me to just listen without having to interact with the board. And let's do a quick switch so they can see what it looks like from the participant side, Matt. I'll go ahead and bring you to me and we can see what it looks like on your end. So let me go ahead and do that. I will bring everyone to me. All so right. now the screen so share Matt, that you've been watching, yeah. Mm -hmm. Matt is following me. He's got no hands and we are moving around the board together. So I can really present and take control of the session remotely, which is super helpful from a facilitator standpoint. 
And some other um, capabilities within attention management that I think are pretty great is bring one person to me. Let's say we have one stray sheep that's off in the wrong part of the board. We can bring them back over. Uh, we can also follow. I really love this for facilitators who, um, especially maybe when you're in breakout rooms and you are interested to see what your participants are doing, you kind of want to see if anyone is stuck, you can click on anyone's avatar and follow them and see what they're working on. So it's a great way to sort of supervise from afar, um, just like you might do in a physical room. Some other collaborative tools that are really valuable are the built-in video chat. I don't think we should do a live demo of that today. I don't want to get any mic feedback for you guys, but you can launch a video chat directly from your Miro board. It will send an, an alert, a pop-up to everyone on the board to ask them to join you in the video call. And it's a great way to run a video call from within Miro. But Miro also works great with video conferencing tools such as uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, WebEx. Uh, you can use them side by side, but you can also just simply launch a video right from within Miro. The second is our built-in voting plugin. So we showed you dot voting earlier, but now we'd love to show you our built-in voting plugin. So you access that from the bottom left-hand corner as well, uh, from the collaboration toolbar. And this will allow you to run an anonymous vote. So that would be the primary difference between dot voting and the voting plugin is dot voting, you're gonna see everyone voting and it's a little more lightweight, whereas anonymous, um, the voting plugin is anonymous, which is gonna be extra level privacy for your team. So Matt's gonna highlight the area of the board he wants to vote on, click done. He can set the time, so how long the voting session will be. You can set it for five minutes, two minutes. You can even set it for 24 hours or more if you wanna do an asynchronous vote for maybe a team that's distributed around the world and hey, everyone come vote on this in the next day before we meet again. Choose the number of votes and choose the object that you want to vote on. So typically people vote on sticky notes, but you could also vote on shapes, um, images, lines, text, and then set the vote. And you can also schedule your vote for later. So now on my end, I received a pop-up to let me know the voting session is live. I can join this voting session, add my votes, and at the end, Matt can tally up the votes and those results will be displayed on the board for you um, as well and stored in Miro. Let's see what the results were. Did you have a chance to vote or did I do it too fast? <laughs> I didn't vote this time. Oh, okay. It's tallying the results now. And you can see in this panel, uh, it just shows them in descending order. Great, and then if you go to that area on the board, you can also see the results actually on, if we have the voting session, you can see the results on the sticky notes or the objects themselves. Um, and then so you can use that to grab those items, you know, cluster them, bring them off to the side, order them on the board by their number of votes. So that makes that a really easy way to do that as well. All right, finally, we'd love to um, share with you a little bit about the timer, the countdown timer. Uh, this is a great way to time box activities in your account and to display that timer for everyone who's on the board. So simply click on the timer from the bottom left-hand corner, start the time, it will display on all the participants' boards and will chime simultaneously on everyone's computer. So um, definitely take advantage of the timer as well. All of these features on this slide are a part of our paid suite. So you should, um, they're not available on the free plan, although there are trials available. That's a common question we'll, we get. So just uh, to preempt that a little bit. Yeah, great point. If you are on the free plan, you're interested in trying these out, click on the features in Miro and there is a 14 day free trial currently available for bring everyone to me, protected lock and hide frames. We call it the facilitator toolkit trial. So go into Miro, click on those, um, any of those features in the board and you'll be able to activate that trial. Okay, All so right. after, the, yeah, you go ahead. 
<laughs> All right, cool. The aftermath. So after the meeting, what do we do? We had a great workshop. We had a great meeting. But now what? How do we go from idea into action? How do we stay aligned in between meetings? So we wanted to highlight some of the tools that Miro has to help you with that. The first is about task creation and execution. We have decided what we want to work on and now it's time to move into an execution phase. So Miro has great tools built in to help you do this. Um, on the board here, we have four sticky notes and we also have our Kanban framework. So one thing that you can do is to convert your sticky notes into cards and then manage them as tasks on your board. So Matt's gonna demo that. Take our sticky notes, we highlight them, and we convert them to cards. Once we convert them to cards, we have the ability to use them in our Kanban framework so we can track progress through a workflow. This Kanban framework is totally customizable. You can add as many stages to your workflow as you have. And we can also add more information and detail to our cards, such as an owner. We can add more detailed text than just the initial summary. We can assign it to someone. We also have tags and colors, the same as you would with sticky notes. Now, if you're using a task tracking tool such as Jira or Asana, we have an awesome two-way card integration that you can leverage so that you can have bi-directionally synced cards. And we also have integrations built for CA Rally and Azure DevOps so that you can have your tasks in your system of record, but get to take advantage of the visual collaborative nature of the Miro board um, and really replicate that whiteboard experience of working together remotely. The next is Live Embed. So Live Embed is a great way to take your Miro boards anywhere as you move out of your meeting and into the tools where you may do the rest of your workflow. So tools such as Confluence, Jira, Microsoft Teams, Trello, Airtable, Notion, Coda, and more. You can actually embed a live Miro board directly in any of those tools, and it will allow you to edit, collaborate, work together um, within those tools as well. So maybe you have people that aren't using Miro as heavily, um, but really exist in these other tools. Live Embed's a great way to get them to interact, to be able to comment and create living documentation. This is our, this is our favorite. Um, so we're talking about the aftermath. So what happens after the workshop? And we know this isn't super relevant right now for a lot of people, but we wanted to demo this Sticky's Capture um, for all of you. And if you're doing ever, uh, you know, in-person workshops with real sticky notes, then this is a really cool option. So if you click on the three dots, you should find our tools list. And we, here we have Sticky's Capture. We'll go ahead and open it up. And I will search for some sort of image here. So we're searching for an image where I did a user story map. So this is my release one um, user story map. And I'll select that image. Now I'm doing this on my MacBook. But of course, the flow works really, really well on your Miro mobile app on I, you know, your tablet or your, your phone. And so you can just take the picture right from your phone um, with the Miro app. And you'll notice that Miro's looking at the looking at the wall and it's identifying where the sticky notes are. Um, if it misses any for whatever reason, you can click on some area and, um, and select one, but usually it gets them so long as there's good enough contrast. But the coolest part is if I click add to board, not only did it detect the color of the sticky notes, you can see that they are actually Miro editable sticky notes. Look at this. It's so cool. So as um, what's called, which means the text, and it's um, making it into editable sticky notes. So no more manually transcribing. You can instantly digitize the work um, after your in-person workshops when we're all able to do that again. Yes, no more emailing blurry photos of whiteboards. Let's just take that blurry <laughs> photo and convert it yeah. to a mirror board. 
Mm -hmm. Another way that people use Miro following a meeting is to create awesome presentations or maybe during a meeting like Matt and I are doing here today. Um, so Matt has showed you at the beginning frames. Frames are a great way to group and highlight information that's related and important. So one way that I use it at Miro is to keep stakeholders in the loop. Um, so on your Miro board, you may have lots of different information, sticky notes, spreadsheets, files, um, inspiration, research, right? But people aren't going to understand necessarily how to, how to read your board. So creating a presentation across maybe the top of your board that highlights key information, links to those areas of the board is a great way to create that knowledge hub and make it really readable and usable for stakeholders, for audiences that may not be uh, as deeply in the mix with you, but need to be informed. So simply use frames to do this. Grab frames from the left-hand side uh, bar and highlight any information on the board and that will be captured in a frame for you. Uh, and that will go into your frames digest on the left-hand side. So um, you can browse through your board by frame as well. Nice. Lots of different ways you can make your insights actionable after the workshop. And OK, so we're coming up on the end. The last thing we're going to talk about is plans and sharing. Um, this is, of course, really, really relevant as you're deciding what type of features do you need uh, with Miro and what's going to enable you to have the best workshop experience. So what we've done, and again, we'll be sharing this board out with you um, after this session. But this diagram breaks down the sharing options that are available across different plans. And we're going to go through it just really briefly because it's very, very relevant for the workshop's experience. If you look up at the top, you're going to see the list of our plans. The key ones we're going to be looking at right now are the free to understand what do you get, the team and consultant, to understand what's there, and then the enterprise. With the free, it's important to know that there, there are a lot of things that you can do with the free plan. And if you're figuring out what Miro is and um, what it would be like to run a workshop with Miro, check out the free plan. You can have three editable boards, and you can invite as many people to that team as you wish. All of them will then be able to edit like the three boards that are in that team. And so if you create an account that's specific for an engagement or a workshop with your team, they'll all have that access. And you can really get a full understanding of, will Miro work for me? The sharing options that work for the free plan are share with the team. That's turned on uh, automatically for all boards. And if you click on the share icon, you can send links to your boards that don't require authentication, don't require people to sign in or register for Miro. That's what a public link is. And they can view and comment. So in order to do that, you would click on the share button. And this is our share dialogue. As a user of the free plan, I could invite uh, Lindsay to my board, lindsay at Miro.com or whatever. And we could then say that she has edit rights, and the free plan would then add her to the account. Or we could click on share, anyone with the link, and with the free plan, we can view and can comment. Those are the options that would be available for us. With the team and consultant plan, you get some additional options that are really, really, really cool. So if the first one to highlight is an additional um, level of permission for the public link. If I click on the share uh, button again, you can see anyone with the link. With any of our paid plans, you can also set it to can edit. This is a really great option for a workshop. So that way your participants don't have to register for Miro if they don't wish. Uh, it's also free, unlimited um, guest editors per each board. And it's just a really easy way. You just send them the link, right? Um, the downside is that most of the time it will be anonymous. So you kind of exchange that ease of use and the, the cost for the, uh, the anonymity there. Really great option. That's with the can edit the public link. And then the, all, the other option to highlight, if you're working with 
uh, clients, and you need to make sure that you know who they are, that they have registered to Miro, that you can revoke access at any time in a very secure way, then you might need to explore what's called a day pass. Day passes are a specific license type that you can read about um, in our help center. They're available on the consultant plan and the enterprise plan and the business plan. And essentially what it's going to allow you to do is if you click on the share button, you can then type in a specific email like example at Miro.com. And when you click can edit, instead of adding them to the whole team, it's going to add them to this board only. And in order to do that, where they have edit rights, but only accessing one board, and you know who they are, and they are registering for Miro, that's where you're going to want to explore the day pass option. So if any of you are on the consultant or are consultants, you might want to check out the consultant plan. If some of you are, are have access to any enterprise plans, um, you're part of those companies, you might want to check with your administrators to see if your company has access to day passes. Okay, so welcoming any, we're welcoming any additional questions about the permissioning or the plans for this session because we know it's really important for the webinars, uh, for, for workshops, but hopefully that adds a little bit of clarity or at least points you in the right direction. Okay, should we head to the, to the Q&A? How are we doing on time? I think we're doing pretty good. We're right on time. We have about 15 minutes left for Q&A. So we'll give you guys a few minutes to go into Slido and add your questions. And Matt and I will maybe cover these key takeaways for just a second while we let people upvote some questions in Slido. So some key takeaways from today's session are first to use frames and lock stuff down. So when you are creating your boards, uh, use frames to capture and to build presentation and use lock so that your participants won't accidentally um, delete or edit items on the board. That can be really common for someone who's not super familiar with Miro. So that is first. Second is use templates. We have hundreds of templates available for you to use and they're all customizable. Once you drop them on the board, you can make them your own. So you don't need to start from scratch and you can access templates from the templates picker right on the board or you can go to Miro.com slash Miroverse to access community templates where there's even more templates available and templates are really cool niche activities. I think we have like a monster workshop in there that's pretty great. We have um, stinky fish icebreaker, which is fun. We have full blown multi-day design sprints from AJ and Smart from um, many different uh, industry thought leaders as well and Miro experts. So definitely check that out. Send how to's ahead of time and use visual notes to help your participants get onboarded. Give them the resources to feel comfortable so that they can spend their time in the workshop really focusing on the material, not how to use the tool. And Miro has a low learning curve, but you can definitely give them a leg up by including some instructions. Invite anonymous participants um, via guest editor. So if you want to um, send this out to a large group of people and for free, you can use guest editors to do that. And on any of our paid plans, you can uh, password protect your boards so that you can have the ease of guest editors. They won't need to log in. They won't need to create an account. They'll just open the board and start working. Um, but you can also maintain security on that board with the password. And finally, a little plug to Matt's area of expertise is the Miro Academy. So the Miro Academy is such a great resource for learning about Miro. There are tons of videos and courses um, and they're not quite as long as this, so not an hour. So you can watch a four or five minute video on a specific topic that's relevant for you um, from facilitation to collaborating to, Matt, what are some of the other topics you have in there? We have UX design. We have a course on the enterprise um, administration. We have uh, agile workflows where we cover a few agile events. Um, facilitation started with Miro guide and that. <laughs> All right, let's dive into our Q and A. So the first question we have is the most upvoted and it is, 
Any tips for doing breakout rooms smoothly in Miro without extra software tools? Yeah. Um, so the way that I, so I've not only hosted breakout rooms uh, using Miro, but I've also been a part of them. And I personally believe that the best way is to use um, a external video conferencing tool like Zoom. Um, we have our video chat, but right now it doesn't support breakout rooms. It's maximum 25 people. It's good for quick meetings, but for, for breakout rooms, it isn't yet available. So what you're going to do is you're going to find a software that um, or video chat that supports that, and then use multiple frames in order to give each group a breakout space to work. The alternative is to give each person or group of people their own board, but I really in most cases, I don't think it's worth the work to uh, you know, send people their own links to boards, even if you're using guest editor. Um, so you can see in this example, we have the uh, you know each frame and we just call it breakout one, breakout two, breakout three, breakout four. And in Zoom, for instance, it assigns you a number for your breakout room automatically. And so you just say to the group, go to your associated frame on the Miro board and um, in my experience, it's worked out pretty well. Lindsay, do you want to talk about that center stage, um, center stage thing a little bit? So this is something that I've seen on a few different templates, and you don't have to use it. But what it is replicating would be uh, another way I've seen it done is the center stage in the middle with the breakout rooms around it. So it's really trying to like replicate that physical room environment or that physical space on a Miro board where you may go off to separate areas of the room and work in small groups and then come back. And the center stage is the place where each group can bring in what they worked on or what they decided and sort of present it to the group. So whoever has their work on the center stage has the floor, they can present um, just some ideas to replicate sort of that physical group meeting experience. So I saw a question, and I think this relates to what Matt was saying about, do we need to create additional boards for breakout rooms or can we just use the Miro board, which is what is the number of users that you can have on the board at one time or max number of participants? So Miro is uh, built for massive multi-user um, sessions. And we say that you, we guarantee that you can have 200 users on a board at the same time. I think that during distributed though, we crushed that. I think we had 500 people on a board at one time yesterday. So if you're gonna have, if your total session is 200 users or less, you can confidently use one Miro board. Um, and if you have a session that is gonna be more than 200 users, like for example, our offsite this summer uh, where we had I think over 400 Miro Nears in Miro. For some of our breakouts, we would create multiple boards just because that's a lot of people, a lot of cursors on one board at one time. So that's a reason to create multiple boards. If you're having that many people, one thing to, re to remember is that, you know, it's not all about what Miro, how Miro's performance. It can also be about like where people are and in their Wi Fi. So if they are on, mm -hmm. Uh, older machines or whatever, you might recommend to them that they turn off collaborators' cursors. So that option is here. Here are the avatars of other people in the board. And if you disable that, that can really save a lot of, um, I don't know what to call it, computer thinking time. <laughs> and uh, make sure that even if there are hundreds of people on the board, it's still gonna have a nice performance. I think some people can find the curses a bit distracting too if there's so many there. So you can mm -hmm. turn them on at the yeah. beginning, kind of get a feel for the energy of the room or the energy of the board, and then turn them off uh, when it's time to present or if you're really trying to do some focus work so that you don't get distracted. All right, so let's see here. We have a question about hints for using Miro on a small screen. So since everyone's working from home, people are primarily on laptops, uh, which are a smaller screen and zooming in and out can become kind of tough. That's a great point. And uh, we're use both using Miro on our, on our laptops right now. Uh, one tip that I would have, if we again look at the layout that Matt has here on the board, is the large um, labels above different areas on the board. So 
Let's get our screen share back up. Um, but it will allow you to create these visual points of reference that anyone can easily find. So when you're zooming in and out, um, you may right, get lost on the board, but having these large labels on the board where it says activity and everything is grouped underneath it is a great way to create those anchors on the board. Um, you can also build in navigation on the board by linking to different objects. So maybe Matt, you can show um, how you can link from one object to the next. So if someone is zoomed in, let's say we were zoomed in on our instructions or our welcome title, right? And we wanted them to next go to the icebreaker, but we didn't want them to have to zoom out and then go find it. Matt can put a link directly on the board to the next activity. So we'll go to link to and then select the object that we want to link to. You can paste in an external link with using this function. So if it's like Google dot whatever, you can put that link in here, but you can also just hover over any object in Miro and select it. And it'll insert that board object link. Every, every object in Miro has a unique link. So you can get that, I'll show you in just a second. But if we go over here, you can see that this text box now has a little arrow and I can click on that and it'll take me right to that frame. If I ever wanted to send someone to a specific frame in my board so they didn't have to find what I'm referencing, I could always, I could do it in two ways, right? I could grab the comment tool and I could at mention them. That way when they get notified, it'll take them to where this comment is, right? That's a good way to do it. Um, and then the other way is to just click on the frame or click on the object, the three links, and click copy link. And then you can send that over Slack or wherever you wish, and they'll it'll be taken to direct that, that specific part of the board. All right, so the next question we have here, again, is about managing participants. And it says, how can you possibly manage 95 participants adding to a board at once? How do you facilitate that many inputs and that many people. I mean, with that many people, if you're not using breakout rooms, you're only going to be doing, at least this is my perspective, Lindsay, maybe you have another one, um, but you're only going to be doing kind of high level, very simple tasks where you're trying to get very kind of <laughs> macro trends about how people are feeling. Um, uh, because unless people are drilling down and having side conversations, uh, yeah, you're not going to be able to have like 95 people have a conversation. Um, so it just really depends on what you're trying to do. So in the video that we showed you with 90 plus people, that was a breakout or that was a brainstorm with one question, right? Um, yeah. So yeah, Lindsay, do you have any do you have any additional thoughts about that? It's super valid. I would totally agree with what you said. I think that with that many people in one activity, it has to be some sort of divergent thought exercise, right? Like let's generate ideas. Let's get as many crazy ideas on the board. Um, and if you want to then move to synthesis, then breakout rooms, small discussions, maybe taking it offline and doing, adding tags and doing like categorizations or clustering would be the way to do that. Now, I haven't ran that many workshops, but we did run a workshop that had about 75 users in it. And what was really great is we did use the breakout rooms. We sent people to their breakout rooms. And what I did as a facilitator was stayed in the main room and watched from the Miro board. Now, as I was looking at the Miro board, I could see people that were adding stickies. I could see their cursors moving around, which visually indicated to me that they were successfully working on the activity. Now, if I saw a breakout room that didn't have, or a breakout area on the board, right, that didn't have sticky notes, where the cursors weren't really moving, um, I could get a hunch that they might be stuck or have a question and hop into that breakout room and help them out. Um, we'd also recommend having multiple facilitators, right, to help you with that as well. People who hang back and kind of observe. But I really use the cursors and the sticky notes to get a sense for how people are doing and where uh, they need more help. Okay. Let's see. 
What are some creative ways to help recognize when people are done with an activity, aside from having them place their cursor in a done box or using the timer? So for this, oh, I kind of just generally look at motion. Sorry, go ahead, Matt. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Same direction. Yeah, for this, I generally just look at the motion on the board. Uh, our cursor is still moving around. Our new objects being created is text going on sticky notes, or are most people just kind of static and hanging out on the board. Um, you know, with the cursors, you really kind of get a buzz. It's not an audio buzz like you would in a room, but you do kind of get a buzz through the motion, through what's created. And if the buzz has died down, um, you know that it's time to wrap up. So that's generally how I do it. Matt, do you have any other tips related to that? I mean, just ideating. I mean, I think that like you could do lots of different things. You could instruct people to select the frame and like change their whole frame color. Or I feel like putting the cursors in the done box um, could work, but if I want to explore the board while I'm waiting, if I got done super fast, I might like start exploring or if I go to another tab or something like that, that would mess that up. So maybe just have people change the cursor from yellow or change this, you know, a sticky note, um, turn green when done. You know, something like that. Most people should be able to figure out or with a little instruction can figure out how to change a sticky note color. Um, things like that. That's top of my head, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right, is it possible to conduct retrospectives and make the participants' responses anonymous? If so, would be curious to see how. Yeah, so there, are, so for context, there are, there's something to, to know. So with, uh, so if you're adding content and people are all there at the same time, you will be able to see individuals add sticky notes and edit, even if they have collaborators cursors off because you'll see who has selected those sticky notes. Um, one way that you can kind of work around that is by creating the sticky notes ahead of time. So that way, even if you click on the, the dots and you click on uh, info, you won't see necessarily who created it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, of other ways uh, that you can make it super, super anonymous. I've gotten this question before in when I'm running uh, webinars on Agile, and I was discussing it with um, a, a, a consultancy called Applied Frameworks, and their suggestion was that, <laughs> they kind of avoided the question, but it was interesting. They said, if you're really concerned about people's retro responses being anonymous, you might have like a culture problem in your team. That's kind of avoiding the question. So I totally acknowledge that I'm, that I'm addressing something else, but it might be something to think about. Um, should I be hiding who's adding the, the retro responses? Is there a place for people to be able to have that open openness and being able to um, share freely? But in the meantime, create the stickies ahead of time so you create them. After yeah. people put the ideas, just move them, and you'll be the last person that edits them, and it'll all be anonymous. That's <laughs> true. Uh, yep. Well, I think that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for tuning in to this webinar on how to use Miro for running remote meetings and workshops. And uh, we'll see you in the next session, and hope you're enjoying Distributed. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks. Bye.